Thank you for tuning in to our Citizen Science presentation. This week, we are celebrating Earth Day's 50-year anniversary. As you all know, Earth Day started as a national campaign to raise awareness on our environment and to bring awareness to how we, as a society, can make a difference in preserving Earth's valuable resources. Before we dive into our citizen science presentation, uh, let me tell you a little bit about who I am and what I do. My name is Cindy Holland and I am the Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator at Mojave Desert Land Trust. I have been in this position for about almost two years now and the main thing that I do is that I recruit and engage volunteers for activities that support MDLT's conservation programs, anywhere from stewardship, outreach, and nursery activities. Um, at the Trust, we also support various aspects of our partners and management goals. Uh, we work closely with different restoration projects with the National Park, um, BLM, and even the Native American Land Conservancy. So if you're listening in today and you're interested um, to learn more about the different volunteer opportunities that we have at the Land Trust, visit mdlt.org for more information. During this presentation, we are going to cover three main areas where you as a community member can contribute in conservation work. I am going to talk about what citizen science is and the importance of community participation. I will talk about citizen science and its relationship to climate change. And last but not least, I will talk about some of the different activities you can participate in as a volunteer and join the movement of becoming a citizen scientist. So let's tackle the main uh, question in this presentation. What is citizen science? Well, according to the dictionary, uh, it is the collection and analysis of data relating to a natural world by members of the public, typically as part of a collaborative project with professional scientists. We can all agree that this is a mouthful, and it's much simpler than uh, what the dictionary actually defines it. All it means is the involvement of the public in scientific research. And as uh, citizen science, because we're popular, we like to think that it is relatively a new term. And I first heard it back in 2016 uh, through the Oregon Shores Co uh, Coalition, through the King Tide Photography Project. We were uh, tracking the rise in sea levels in the Oregon coast. But realistically, people have been participating and contributing to scientific research for years. The term citizen science can actually be dated back to the late 1800s. It was actually a gentleman named Wells Cook uh, who developed arguably one of the earliest formal citizen science programs. His program looked at the patterns of bird migration and it expanded uh, eventually to one of the first government programs for birds. He gathered volunteers to collect information about migratory bird patterns and populations and he had them record all that information on cards. As you can see on your screen, I was able to find a more uh, up-to-date map of North America, kind of tracking the different bird patterns. What you're seeing are four different colors, each representing uh, the different migratory routes in the Western Hemisphere. I also tried looking for the original information card from Cook's research, and I wasn't able to, but I did find one from um, 1937, which is pretty cool. I believe today those cards are being scanned and recorded into a public database for historical analysis. Um, once this project is done, as you can imagine, this is going to be an invaluable information that has been recorded for over 100 years. Fast forward 100 plus years, emerging technologies have influenced the scientific research process by streamlining and automating data collection. It's improved data management and expedited communications. There's now different apps and web pages that appeal now to a diverse set of citizen science participants. So let's think about that for a moment. We are having people from all around the world collecting data, all coming with different backgrounds and different levels of understanding of what scientific research actually is. So that pretty much led to having a wide range of data being submitted with no way of being able to process them. 
Uh, this eventually led to different organizations um, and volunteers coming up with a way to streamline how that information flowed. The Public Participation in Scientific Research program was established in 2013. There were different organizations supporting citizen science that realized there was a gap in the ability to share basic information. Again, like we talked on the prior slide, there's different volunteers across the globe with different levels of understanding um, about the scientific research, so they needed some type of system to streamline and maximize all the efforts and get more bang for the buck out of all the data that the, sci the citizen scientists were collecting. And this did that. So how does citizen science relate to climate change? Well, according to citizenscience.org, environmental observations are the foundation for understanding the climate system. What does this mean exactly? It means that citizen science movements have allowed for more data collection and new technology has really streamlined the quality control of that data. So it is more likely uh, that citizen science uh, will be able to answer the environmental concern posed by climate change. It has widened the horizons that wouldn't typically be possible through, through traditional scientific research and it has saved scientists a lot of time and money while still providing accurate and diverse data. Citizen science is truly a new way to challenge society to propose new climate change solutions. Volunteers are using the evidence they collect to really learn about the environment as they go through the steps of scientific inquiry. So now we are getting to the fun stuff now that we covered all about what citizen science is. Um, let's talk about how you can become a citizen scientist. There are literally hundreds of applications that you all can research at home uh, that are family friendly for you guys all to use. I am only going to cover two just because of the time constraint. The first one that I'm going to cover is Lost Overnight app. This is a supported application for both iPhone and Android and suitable for all ages. This app really allows a citizen scientists to estimate how many stars they can see and kind of track the light pollution there is in the night sky. The second application that I am going to cover today is Noise Tube. This app is actually recommended by our education coordinator, Mary. The supported platforms, unfortunately, currently are only Android, but the Apple version is under development. This is suitable for teens and adults. Uh, what this app does is it really allows uh, volunteers to measure the amount of noise that they, they are exposed to in urban areas. And then the information is uploaded and can be used by scientists uh, for decision making. If you want to take a more hands-on approach on this whole citizen science movement, you can actually become a citizen scientist uh, with MDLT. Currently, we are partnering with scientists who are collecting different genome data on our Joshua trees. Um, and the project is called Joshua Tree Genome Project, if you haven't heard of it. Uh, basically, what we're doing is we're going out um, into the desert on BLM land on hikes, and we are systematically getting data by measuring and counting uh, the surroundings of the Joshua Tree. Um, and it's truly a wonderful experience. You get to work with other students, volunteers, and educators, and really just you're just sharing your love uh, for a California desert. So if this is something that interests you, definitely stay tuned for more information because we have more to come in the future about this project. Thank you so much for listening to this presentation. If you have any questions, please do not hesitate to send me an email at cindy at mdlt.org. If you really like this video and would love to stay connected with future topics, go ahead and click the subscribe button below and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Next week, our education coordinator, Mary Cook Ryan, will be showing us how she makes her favorite mesquite cookie recipe. See you all next week.